Okay, yeah, thank you, Coach Banstra, for having me on and letting me share uh, what I have today about culture and the name of this presentation. I tried to narrow everything down into five specific laws of cultivating culture. Uh, my name is Aaron McKelkey. I'm the head football coach at Kelly Walsh High School, which is in Casper, Wyoming. Uh, this is the first year here we're finishing up at Kelly Walsh. Um, Came, in, came into town uh, last July, so trying to put things together on the fly. Had a tough season, had some positives, had some negatives. Our school is not historically a football power. Part of the attractiveness of the job for me is I have that builder mindset. And uh, one winning season the last 10 years before I came here, and so I thought, man, that'd be a great place to go build up kids and build some pride in a football program and have some success on the field. Also, you know, good opportunities here for my wife and for my kids. Before this, I was at Big Piney High School in Western Wyoming, small school. Took over uh, an 0-8 program. I was an assistant there for that 0-8 season. And then we had some success, had a couple of good seasons, finished with, uh, you know, we got to the semifinals in 2017 and we're a, a field goal away from playing for a state championship. So we, we had some success, especially from where we started. And before that, I was an assistant. I, I actually coached nine man football in Timber Lake, South Dakota on an Indian reservation. That was my first teaching job. And my first gig was at Bozeman High School with head coach Troy Purcell, who's now the head coach at Carroll College in Helena, Montana, great mentor of mine. So. I've had a wide array. I've coached at a high school of 90 kids that played nine man. And now Kelly Walsh, we have probably about 1900 kids in our school and we're the biggest enrollment in the state. So I appreciate you guys tuning in. My contact info is on the screen. Uh, shoot me an email, the Twitter handle, and then all the links are at that bit.ly link at the bottom, this presentation, a few other things we have. So we're going to roll and uh, get into it. So, I, I hate when coaches give breakdowns of like their wins and losses and stats. And part of that is because mine are not impressive. What I want to start with is I want you to take a second and ask yourself these three questions. So here's the first one. If you were a fly on the wall in your locker room after an average practice and you heard one of your kids, just some average kid talking about what the culture of your team really is, what would you hear him say? And I want you to think about what would that average kid on an average day of practice say if he didn't know you were listening. Second question is take the average guy on your coaching staff. So not your most loyal assistant, not your defensive coordinator, not your favorite guy or best friend on the staff, just middle of the road commitment level guy. Let's say he's in the suburban on the way home from a game and the head coach is not in there and you hear him talking about what he thinks the culture of your team really is, what would you hear? And then the last one is ask the head coach of the best team in your league, what the culture of your team really is. What would he say? And the reason I, I asked those is number one, just to get you thinking, because a lot of times we think the culture of our own team is what we want it to be. And we can be a little myopic with that. And then we're going to talk about detaching, but I think if you take these three answers and kind of combine them, the average player, you know, some JV backup D lineman who doesn't have a coach listening, uh, some, you know, freshman coach or, or varsity position coach who's not super dedicated or super bought in. What does he think the culture really is? And then that coach who's the, the best head coach in your league, what does he say about your team? I think that's what your culture really is. So we're going to start with that. And then what we're going to say is that there are sort of five laws you can boil culture down to and and this isn't specific to football teams this could be your family this could be your high school this could be your school district or your business or corporation whatever but um number one is that all teams have a culture and you either get the one that you design or the one that you let happen and and i've been a part of both 
Um, and we'll talk about some of those. The second law is that the only way to accurately gauge what your own team's culture is, is to detach from it. So basically run through those three questions that we just talked about. The third law is that culture is the invisible hand that guides everything in your program. And sometimes people get caught up and say culture is this abstract, aloof concept that's hard to measure and it's weird and whatever. And what I would tell you is that culture is just how you do things, not what you do, but how you do them. The fourth law of cultivating culture is that you shape the culture based on what leaders proclaim, promote, and permit. And in that order of importance, the, the most important is what you permit or tolerate. Then the last law of cultivating culture is that the most powerful tool for cultivating culture, if you want to change it, build it, shape it, is to have small group or one-on-one -on -one activities. It's not having your whole team in one big meeting. Uh, if it's with your staff, it's not having your whole staff in a meeting. It's breaking it down to as small a level as you can to transmit that. So we're going to go through those and, and I have some examples and a couple stories and some templates of things that I've used to try to do these things. Um, I haven't been perfect. I haven't even always been good at these. I think the reason I value culture and how it's important to cultivate cultures because I've been in toxic, negative, losing cultures. And as a head coach, I've taken over programs that had cultures by default or, or losing cultures and had to fight that uphill battle to change it. So the, the first law is just, if you're going to create culture by design or let it happen by default. And so uh, I'm a Notre Dame fan and I found this funny picture of Brian Kelly and he's gotten better in recent seasons, but he used to be pretty famous for his reddish purple angry coach Kelly face as usually screaming at a quarterback after a turnover. And so my example for this is as coaches, we all have battles that we're willing to draw a line and fight, um, whether that's kicking a kid off the team or having a consequence or even just kind of losing our cool over things. We all do that. And one of the programs that I worked at in the past, not the one that I'm at now, I remember as an assistant, I watched um, this player show up on the first day of practice 30 to 40 minutes late. And I turned to one of the other assistants and I just said, Hey, what's the rule of being late here in our program? And this assistant kind of looked at me and shrugged and he said, I don't know, man, I don't think we have any rules. And I remember watching the coach, um, just let him jump in drills, the head coach, nothing happened. It was like no big deal. And, um, later on in that season, a kid, same exact scenario, different kid showed up late. And this coach just went Brian Kelly, purple face ballistic. And he made the whole team run and he was kind of ranting and raving and trying to be a authoritarian, you know, yelling, screaming coach. And you could just see it on everybody's faces. Like there wasn't a rule. No one ever was told that, but we had this big meltdown over it and everybody freaked out. Um, so my point is, if you don't have that codified or written down or posted or on the wall or have a meeting about it, it's not really fair to go ballistic and make that a big deal, whether that's with kids or assistant coaches or parents. So you, you got to have some things to stand on that you can point to and say, look, you know, that's the expectation or that's the rule, or this is the standard to which we do things. Um, and so, I'm going to share a couple examples of, of how you can do that. Um, I haven't done this one. I've worked with coaches who do, and this is based on core covenants from proactive coaching. And it's a little booklet I have. It's probably costs like five or seven bucks. They give them out at coaches clinics. Um, what I like about this is they have a process to go through and pick. Um, these are some examples of, core beliefs or values, and you can include your assistant coaches, you can include your captains, whatever. And then they go through and break down what's this look like in the classroom, on the field, in the weight room, on game day at practice, whatever, and have that posted on the wall, uh, on the front of a handout. If you have a team manual or a playbook you give out, you put that in the front. 
the reason I don't use that is because I feel like it's just a little bit too busy, but I've been, uh, worked with some other head coaches who had a lot of success with this and did some cool things. Um, and that's what the book looks like by Bruce Brown from proactive coaching. So that's one way to have a culture by design instead of just letting it happen. Second way, which is awesome. And I've done, uh, for a couple seasons, we didn't do it this past year is based on Randy Jackson's two books, culture defeat strategy, which are probably the best high school football specific strategy resources I've ever come across. And basically what he does is have you come up with a value for each day of the week. So Mondays have a theme like play fast or team or brotherhood, toughness, Tuesday, payday, Friday, whatever. And you link those to a day. So that day always has a focus and that way kids are hearing it from you or hearing it from assistant coaches. And they could tell you on Mondays, this is the focus on Tuesdays. This is the focus, whatever. And, and that was awesome. I, I've had a lot of success with that. What we went to, um, this last year for the first time was just what focus three calls a culture playbook. And so you say, okay, what results do you want to get? And what we said is we want to have a brotherhood in our program and we want to have a common standard. And so you almost fill out this box uh, first and then you go back and say, okay, what do you have to believe in to get that? And so what we said for the brotherhood is that you have to value service over self, um, being unselfish. And then you take three to five behaviors that show you believe in service over self. The reason I like this way to design your culture is it's the most simple. Um, I did kind of think the days of the week thing was a little bit cheesy and it's almost like, well, toughness matters on Tuesday, but what about Wednesday? And it's still a good system, but I thought this, you know, if you, if you only pick two things that you think you really have to build or be able to rely on to be successful in your program, I, I thought two for our culture playbook was good. And then we use those bullet point behaviors in different ways that practices and the games that we'll talk about later. But the point is, if you don't have one of these methods, if you don't have it written down on a wall, a poster and a meeting, whatever, you're still going to have a culture, but it's going to be the one that you just allow to happen. And usually with high school age boys, they're going to rise and fall the level of the expectations of the leader. So if you don't have a high standard, yeah, you'll have a few guys that'll go above and beyond and still be hard workers and have success in your program. But critical mass is probably not going to rise up. It's probably going to fall if that's what you allow. So the second law of cultivating culture is the only way to accurately assess your own team's culture is to detach from it. So like those three questions we asked, um, here, here's some non football ones. So if you think as a teacher, if you work in a school, what's the culture of your school really like? So, um, an example, you know, a lot of people say, well, the, the mission vision values stuff on the wall and the hallways that the school board post says this, but it's really X. So I want you to just think about if you work in a school, what's the culture of your school really like? And then if you went and asked your principal, what do you think the culture of the school is really like? How is his or her answer going to compare to yours? And which one do you think is really more accurate? The one coming from the head honcho behind the desk or the one coming from the teacher or coach in that school? Another example, it's easy to think of, of other teams. If you pick the worst team in your league, the worst team on your schedule and said, what's the culture of that team like? So uh, an example from a past job, not where I'm currently at in this league, but there was a team that, you know, chronically underperformed, never made the playoffs, losing seasons, whatever. But one of their issues was they were always the first ones to whine to the refs, make excuses, blame other people, um, criticize others. And I remember just thinking as a coach on the opposing sideline that that was a huge part of why they weren't good is because I never saw anybody take ownership and say like, Hey, we just weren't very good or we're not the best team today. There was always an excuse and like they played the blame game. Um, but think about how easy it is to say that about the worst team in your league. Now go ask that team's head coach, what he thinks his team's culture is. I don't think you're going to get the same answer, probably not even in the same ballpark. And then, you know, the last one is with your own family 
as I'm assuming a father and a leader in your family, what do you think the culture of your own family is like? Well, what if we had Dr. Phil come in and set up cameras in your house and like observe you and your wife and your kids and how you do things for a week? What would he say the culture of your family is? And the point of all three of those is it's really hard to get an accurate view when you're so directly involved. And if you're a head coach, for a lot of us, it's, it's kind of like your little baby. It's your own creation. And you can't get an accurate gauge on something that you're so emotionally invested in. So you got to find ways to step back and look at it almost like if you were a consultant for this program, how would you gauge and, and assess the culture versus if I'm the head coach who's in there on the front lines every day. And so I'm a history teacher and I think a great example, um, is in communication of ancient and medieval armies. And so this is really nerdy, but I think it's really true for football. If you look at the Battle of Liegnitz in 1241, a group of Mongols who were of course outnumbered by a bunch of European kingdoms like the Polish and, and a couple of their neighbors, the way that the Mongols communicated, their leaders didn't go out on the front lines. They weren't swinging swords and shooting bows at the front of the battle because they were smarter than that. And they knew you had to be detached from the heat of the moment to make good decisions and communicate and evaluate what's going on in the battle. And so the Mongol leaders would sit up on the highest point they could find, like on top of a hill. And they would use flags or drums, or sometimes they'd even shoot arrows that had messages from one unit to the next so that they could change plans. And one of the reasons why they were successful is if their initial plan didn't go well, that leader sitting up on the hill, detached from the heat of the battle, not so emotionally invested, not getting shot at. And he could sit back and say, okay, I want you guys to do this and let's change that. If you look at how the Europeans fought, they were big on leading by example, which is important, but their leader would be the guy in the front line swinging the sword in the heat of the battle. And once you make a plan and say, all right, guys, let's go do this, follow me. If you never step back and detach to look at it, you can't change and, and you can't get an accurate picture from the front lines. You got to have the zoomed out kind of satellite view. And so one of the nerdy things I always think to myself as a head coach is, you want to lead like a Mongol general, not like a European or a crusader who's trying to do it all by yourself on the front line. You want to be the guy that's kind of up above with the long-term view and think like a consultant for your team rather than the head coach. So the only way to accurately assess your own team's culture is you have to detach. The third law of cultivating culture is how do you measure it? Like, what is it? And so what we always say is it's just how you do things. And some examples in high school football programs, everybody has film sessions and meetings. Not everybody does them on the same week or for the same amount of time, but we all watch film with our kids and with our coaches. How many kids are sleeping in your film session? How many people are late to it? How many people have their phone out and are texting their girlfriends instead of paying attention? Um, another huge one is how you communicate. Everybody's gonna show good plays and bad plays on film. What happens when you have a film clip up on the screen and Johnny just absolutely whiffed the block and gave up a sack? How do you communicate that? I mean, do you chew kids out? Do you put them on the spot? Um, do you kid glove them? One of my pet peeves in coaching, all of us who took coaching classes in college, they were big on the, the crap sandwich method where they'd say, you know, you got to give kids this positive compliment and then give them the real sort of criticism and then follow with the compliment. So it doesn't hurt their feelings so much. And I think you can tell a lot about how somebody runs a film session and the actual running of film is not what gives you an advantage or makes you better. It's how do you do it? The standard to which you hold people in your film sessions and your meetings. Um, another great example is warm ups. It's not that there's a magic best way to warm up, but are your kids actually doing what you want them to do? One of the things we always ask kids to do is everybody has some kind of sprint or build up or a full speed run in your warmups. How many of your kids actually go full speed? And then better yet, what happens when a kid doesn't? Does anybody say anything to them? Does a coach jump them? Does a kid jump them? Do people just turn a blind eye and, and let it go? 
And one of the, the good things I've gotten from this golden age of Zoom meetings since the pandemic hit, I've, I've been in on a ton of these. A guy said, hey, when we do warm-ups, we have stopwatches and we just time our kids and there's no punishment, but we yell out times to make it competitive and get kids to want to go full speed. And that to me shows, okay, we do warm-ups too, but we haven't had a stopwatch and a coach yelling out times. The way that they do it, the how of their warm-up shows their culture. Another one is walkthroughs. Everybody has walkthroughs. A lot of teams do it on Thursday mornings or Thursday evenings. We did it after team dinners. What's your kid's focus level? How tuned in are your coaches? Do you have music going or not? Um, are guys hitting, going full speed? Do you literally walk through? Um, I know a coach who lets his kids wear like baseball caps and, and like hats, cowboy hats to walkthroughs. That's part of the, the culture of his team. So. We all do walkthroughs, but I've never had kids with cowboy hats and baseball hats. That's just the culture of his team, and he's had success with that. Another how is lifting. Everybody has lifting sessions, but how do you do it? Is it competitive? Do you have loud music? What happens when a kid skips a rep or a set or lies on his weight or doesn't go low enough on his squat or whatever? So, it, you know, you look at the best team in your league, I doubt they have the, the most technologically advanced lifting program, but the how of executing theirs is probably what sets them apart. And then the last one is scheme. So if you just think about this example, let's say you run the option. If you took um, Navy's playbook and copy and pasted it into yours and tried to run that, you could have the exact same formations, play calls, signals, terminology, whatever. That's not going to make you successful, but how you execute it and how you run that, that's what's going to make you successful. I mean, nobody's trying to copy and paste Nick Saban's playbook, and it's not because their X's and O's aren't sound or even phenomenal. They are, but it's how they do it. And so scheme is a great example. There's a lot of great teams that run a 4-2-5. There's a lot of bad teams that run a 4-2-5. The difference is how they run it and to the standard to which they hold their players and their coaches. So the third law of cultivating culture is just, it's how you do things. It's not some warm and fuzzy, lofty, abstract thing. Um, it's not always easy. So I think a lot of people would tell you that a culture is like comfortable and, and fun and cool. And yeah, there are fun and cool things about your culture, maybe, or being on your team, but there's gotta be some kind of nasty, hard, difficult conversations, people getting held to high standards, one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations and, and some negative stuff too, or else you're just gonna let everything fly. It's never done. Um, especially in high school football, I think those of us who've been in, in teams that didn't have a great culture, we, we lie to ourselves and say, well, once we get it where we want, it's just like on autopilot and you just let it happen. But that great group of kids or leaders or that good class is going to graduate. And every year you have new freshmen that need to be indoctrinated into your culture. And if you have turnover with your staff, unless you have the same group of guys year in and year out, you're always trying to build that with your coaches as well. So it's never just done. It's not abstract. Um, and as a head coach, especially, it's not what your poster on the wall says you want it to be. It's what that average kid, average coach, and the best coach in your league say. So if you just think about what is culture in a quantifiable way, it's just the standard to which you do things in your program. Um, the fourth law of cultivating culture is that it's shaped based on what the leaders, not just you as the head coach, but your assistants, your captains, your seniors, the leaders in each grade or position unit leaders, what do you proclaim, promote, and permit? And this is straight from Brian Kite, who's a focus three guy. And I have some credits at the end for people, but proclaiming is just like your messaging. So what's on the wall, what's on the signs, in your field house, in your locker room, on the bulletin board. I know coaches who send remind messages or whatever kind of messaging platform you use with your players. They send out culture stuff. They send out leadership uh, quotes and videos and things like that. Um, a, a cool way, we had a group of kids a few years ago that would take sort of our culture playbook and then every Thursday night when they got home from team dinner, they'd put that on their Snapchat stories 
And so you could go through on Snapchat and every kid on our team had posted the same thing that just said who we are, where we're going and how we get there. And they use social media. That was an organic thing. The coaches, I didn't tell kids, hey, go put this on your Snapchat. We just had a few seniors that did that. And that's part of building culture is proclaiming it and telling the world and telling your team what it is. And it's also what you hear at practice and at games. So if, if somebody came to your practice or your position area drill for 15 minutes on a random day, what would they hear you talk about? How, how would you communicate to kids? Would you use those words that are in your culture playbook or do you just leave that stuff on the wall when you go out to practice and, and not take it out on the field? Um, a cool idea that I got from a coach in Illinois, everybody has a document of coaching assignments. So who's in charge of the water, the managers, the cameras, who's the D-line coach, who's the coordinator. He actually assigns each coach a phrase or an aspect of culture and says, man, that's your thing that you got to say every five minutes of every day. And so I haven't used that on the field, but when we brought in some new coaches this spring, I, I showed our guys, here's our culture playbook. And then there's a link to that in the Google drive folder. And I said, which of these six behaviors do you feel like you, you live the best? Like you're, you're the most true. And I assigned that to them and, and basically said, all right, that's going to be your thing to own. And no matter what day of the week it is, practices or games, I want you to be the guy that kids always hear talking about build up others. Or I want you to be the guy that's always talking about sacrifice for the team. And so we actually have that on our coaching assignment spreadsheet is like, that's your part of the culture that you have to own. Um, another one, like the Randy Jackson example is, having a culture focus um, instead of always having the same ones on the same day, what we would do when we go out with kids this year is we pick one of those six behaviors and said, Hey, today's focus is on celebrate excellence. Coaches are going to be watching. We're going to be saying that we're going to be shouting out guys who do it. And then you as players should be doing that the same. Um, you, you can use the themes like I've done toughness Tuesday was one and kids come up with little hand signals. So uh, our guy that came up with a toughness Tuesday in a past program, he flexed, but then point to his head. So it was like physical and mental strength. And that was kind of like the, the handshake or the signal on Tuesdays. And then if a guy's not doing that, like a guy's complaining or not being tough in a drill, you didn't have to say anything. You just do that little flex and point to your head thing. And you knew, Hey, toughness Tuesday, let's go competition Thursday, payday Friday is a, a cool one that Randy Jackson does. Um, another awesome one is just make a playlist. So if you don't listen to music at practice, you can do it in the locker room before or after practice or on game day. Um, I haven't done a playlist that was tied to the culture, but I was listening to a podcast back in January and they, they talked about you do toughness Tuesday, then at Tuesday practice, whatever music you play, have a playlist of songs about being tough. And so the point is like, get this stuff in front of kids. They should see it. They should hear it. They should feel it. Um, PJ Fleck even, even uses smells and has like a new car smell in the trophy case and, and stuff like that. So it's just about getting that in front of kids. So they hear it all the time. And so like I went, I haven't used these with kids, but one of our culture playbook behaviors to celebrate excellence. So I was bored sitting at home and just went and made a playlist of songs about winning and having fun and being the best and thought, you know, on the day that we pick a culture focus is celebrate excellence. Then I want kids to hear that on the practice field or in the locker room. So that's the least important, the, the sort of second most important aspect of shaping culture is who or what do you promote? Cause I, I literally mean people in your program. And so a word that I try to use all the time is meritocracy and kids always laugh at me, but I'll ask them if you're a boy scout, how do you get a merit badge for camping? And they always look at me and they're like, I don't know, like go camping. I just say, yeah, it has to be based on merit. If you walked up to your boy scout counselor and said, I'll give you a thousand bucks cash for that merit badge, would he give it to you? And they always laugh and say, no, you have to actually go do it. And so if you think about, who or what gets promoted in your program? Is it based on who does stuff the right way? Who does stuff the best? Who's the most true to what you want your culture to be? And as a history nerd, I always tell kids, you know, Mongols like Genghis Khan, 
promoted their generals and, and their officers based on merit. They didn't care what family you came from, what your last name was, how much money you had. Uh, guys like Napoleon, when he came to power in France, a lot of the armies he fought against, those generals could just go buy their position and go to the king and say, hey, my family's rich. I want a, a spot in your army. Here's a bunch of money. And it didn't matter if you knew anything about it. You could just buy the spot. And so some ways to measure that in your program, if you do captains for a leadership council, is just look at who do you put on there and what is that based on? And what do kids and coaches say about who gets on there? So you might say, well, uh, every player votes and whoever gets the most votes, that's the captain. But does that average player in your locker room think it's just a popularity contest or just the guys who kiss up to your coach or just the brown nosers? Um, I think a really underutilized one is which kids get to play up or dress for varsity. So it depends on the size of your program. One great example, when I was in high school, our freshmen, they would pick two kids every week that get to dress, travel for varsity games. And you almost never got in the game. But what our head coach said was, it doesn't cost any extra money. We don't need an extra bus to just take two freshmen. But what they would do at the end of every week of practice, say on Thursday night, is say, hey, which two freshmen work the hardest? They'd announce those two guys. They'd get to go travel. And you're the only two freshmen on the sideline and on the bus. And, and I got to go one week. And it was a cool thing. And you kind of make the connection of like, hey, that's what the coaches say they want. If you do it, you get rewarded. You're one of only two guys that actually got to come to this game. And so, you know, I've coached with guys. One of them uh, in, in a league I was in said, I just don't let freshmen dress. And I just thought, man, for home games, you already have enough uniforms. You don't have to feed them. You don't have to travel. Why not have some system of merit where you say the hardest workers or the most improved or the best leaders or whatever you want to base on in your culture, those guys get picked to dress out. Um, and if you're a bigger program, maybe that's with sophomores, you know, in our program, we have well over a hundred kids, nine through 12. So we can't really take freshmen, but we did sneak them, uh, as managers. Like we had some freshmen do video stuff for a game and maybe have them hold a clipboard, um, or, or with sophomores, you know, what sophomores do you let travel and dress out? So I think that's a powerful thing you can use to, to promote your culture and show that you're a meritocracy. And then here's a huge one is what coaches in your program get promoted. You know, if you have some veteran guy on your staff, who's a coordinator and he retires or leaves and you promote from within, what do you base that on? And one of the things I always think about is just which guys are the most true to our culture, which guys do I want to have more of a leadership role in my program? Maybe they don't know the X's and O's as well, or have as much experience, but they're true to what we do. And if I say I value something, then I have to promote people based on, how they live those values. One way that we do this, and I stole this from a really um, successful coach in our state, is we do post-practice rewards, and then we do the same thing after games, but it's just a shout out. So say on that Tuesday practice, we go out, and we tell kids, hey, the behavior we're looking for today is celebrate excellence. I went to a bunch of local restaurants and fast food joints and said, whatever free food coupons you can give, I'll take a pile of them. So we had free taco coins from Taco John's. We had a uh, free dilly bar, little tokens from Dairy Queen. We had the manager of a Perkins restaurant give us a bunch of free muffins and milkshake coupons. And so each coach would just stand up after Tuesday's practice when all the kids come in and circle up and we'd say, all right, each coach is giving out a free taco to Taco John's who is your celebrate excellence guy? And they'd say, Hey, I saw Johnny in this drill. Um, his buddy made a great catch and, and he really made a big deal and celebrated excellence when his buddy made that catch and you flip him a free taco. And the point is not, Hey, I get a free taco. The point is I get a shout out in front of the whole team. And when coaches say they value celebrating success, we follow up with that. I also know a college program when you, when you go to their camp in the summer, a cold Gatorade, might cost you a dollar at Sam's Club as a coach, but that's a powerful way to shape culture. In June, when it's 95 degrees and kids are sweating, you just throw a cold Gatorade to a kid um, that embodies what you wanted them to do. So that, that's a huge one and been good for us. 
And then the last one is just, if you're trying to promote culture is you have to talk to kids about what's in it for them. If you just say, Hey, that's how we do things. That's just our culture. And, and I've been guilty of that a ton, especially early in my career. It's kind of like buy in or get out. And something I've learned to appreciate more, the longer that I've coached and the more experience I've had is something that a smart coach taught me that he calls validate, but don't tolerate. And that's when a kid is out of bounds or not doing what you want him to do. Look at it from his perspective and say, what's in it for Johnny to celebrate excellence? What if he doesn't want to do that? What if he, he thinks that's stupid? And instead of just saying like, well, that's how the team does it. You go, Hey man, if you want to be a starter, right? Yep. Do you want to play? Yep. You want to be the best receiver in our school's history? Yep. That's my goal. Okay. Then here's why you need to do this. And I understand why you might think it's cheesy or think it's dumb, but this is what I need you to do. And uh, another example is I was at a JV game this, this past season and I heard one of our quarterbacks snap at the offensive line and he, he kind of did the passive aggressive under his breath thing where he, he said, you know, O-line, you guys effing suck. And, and I thought to myself, my first year head coach version of me, I would have just flown in there and grabbed that kid and shoot him out and benched him for a half uh, and, and been like, violent. I would have been a dictator with that. And that doesn't always work, especially with kids that are pain in the butt. And so what I've learned is if you grab that kid and pull him off to the side and talk to him one-on-one -on -one and say, Hey man, I get why you're frustrated. You know, maybe you got sacked four times in the first half and yeah, the O-line wasn't blocking great, but what do you want to get out of today's game? Do you want to, you want to have a good half? Do you want to pass? Do you want to have time to, to drop back and not have pressure in your face? And you know, the kid will say, Oh yeah, of course. Okay, now think about it. If you're an O lineman, do you want a quarterback that calls you, you know, swear words and, and talks crap to you? Or do you want a quarterback that's going to build you up and be positive and, and show the kid how that's in their best interest to do, not just because you said so? So, the most important part of shaping culture is what you permit. And I think this is the hardest one. It's one that at times I've been the worst at and, and I've learned to appreciate how powerful it is by screwing it up. But if you ask the head coach, hey, what are your team standard or, or rules? They can always tell you. But my question is go ask a random player or some random coach on your team without looking it up or seeing the bulletin board, what are your standards or rules in your program from memory? Whatever they say, are your real standards. It's not what you put on a document. It's not what you want them to be. Of course, we know them. We made them up. We printed them out. We posted them. That's not what they really are. And so if you don't make those super clear, or if you're a coach that, yeah, I posted everywhere, but when I go out on the field, we're not actually held to that. And I let things slide and, and permit that stuff to not be to the level I want, then that's not really your culture. We use the term enforcers, and that's a Jeff Jansen term. He's a great leadership author. But who are the enforcers of your standard in your program? You know, as a head coach, especially in year one at new programs, I've been guilty of trying to be the sole biggest, baddest enforcer. And there's just no way you can do that. Number one, you don't have enough time and energy. And number two, if you're the only enforcer, all your kids and coaches are going to think that you're a prick. And so, you know, the way we think of it is, let's say a, a player's late to practice and you're kind of up on a hill watching, like we talked about detached, what's going to happen? Is I'm going to say anything to them? Is there going to be a consequence? You're not always going to change kids' behaviors, but one of the signs that you know you're changing culture in your program is we had a, a rule. We, we don't swear at practice because I, I let coaches bring their kids. My sons are six and two. And so I always tell kids on our team, hey, my sons might be on the sideline. I don't want a kindergartner taking any new vocab words into his teacher's classroom. And I'll never forget towards the end of the season, one of our best players who, who had a potty mouth, he swore in practice. And then he looked at me and then he looked at one of our coach's daughters and he's like, oh man, 10 boom booms, I know coach. And it was like, he still broke the rule, but he instantly knew Here's the consequence. No one has to tell me. I'm just going to do it right now. Um, another big one is what, what happens if a coach is late to your practice? Does the head coach say something to him? Does one of his fellow assistants say something to him? Does nobody say something to him? Who are those enforcers that are going to hold the standard in your program? 
if you're in practice and a kid gives a poor rep effort on a, a rep is poor, excuse me, what's that look like? Are the guys in line in his ear about it? Is the coach in his ear about it or is nobody in his ear about it? That's how you can tell who the enforcers are in your program. And then we all have expectations for, for language, whether it's swearing or even just how you talk to refs. Um, if you're complaining about a ref on a Friday night, do your own assistants call you out in a respectful but direct way and say like, hey, coach, lay off the refs? Uh, if your best player did that with somebody else in the huddle, hold them accountable or they just let it slide? And what I've learned is you have to really explicitly, like word for word, have this conversation with your coaches and your kids that are leaders and tell them you guys are like deputies. And so if you think about the sheriff, he's got that star on his chest and he's the long arm of the law in, in the town, but he doesn't go arrest every criminal. He doesn't break up every bar fight himself. He's got to deputize some guys and they have the exact same, you know, logo or star on their chest. It may not be as big a star, but that deputy said, Hey, you have the same power I do and gave him a, a revolver and some handcuffs and a star and said, you can go enforce the same rules as me. And you have to really word for word, black and white, have that talk. And that's a huge mistake that I've made, especially with coaches. Sometimes we think, oh, coaches will enforce stuff because they know it's a rule. A lot of coaches don't like conflict. They don't want to be enforcers. It's not their personality. They want to be liked, whatever. You got to pull them aside and say, listen, man, I need you to hold the line and keep kids accountable on this or your kids late to practice, whatever. And I'll show you an example. Um, and then if you want them to keep doing it, you have to have their backs because they're going to ruffle some feathers. Some freshman's going to complain. Some knucklehead on your team is going to say, oh, you're not a coach. You can't tell me what to do. And you got to go, hey, Johnny, you're doing a great job, man. I, I made you a deputy. You got the same star as me. That's what I need. And we've all heard that saying on bad teams, nobody holds anybody accountable. On good teams, coaches hold players accountable. And the best teams, players hold each other accountable. And we all want that, but until you have that explicit conversation with kids and say, hey, man, you're a deputy. I need you to go enforce this with me, and then I'll back you up if there's a problem. You're probably not going to get it. Um, the last law of cultivating culture is just the more you can break down into small groups or even one-on-one -on -one activities, the better. And so we've used a model that we call accountability squads, and I've seen guys do this where it's like boot camp and they have different colored shirts and it's militaristic. That's not how we do it. We do it as a logistical organizational tool. And so what we do is each coach has their own squad. So what I've always based it on is how many total coaches do you have in your program? So at a small school where we had four coaches, we just had four squads and you can either have the coaches go through and draft kids and just pick what kids do you want on your squad or what we've done with the most success is pick four of your leaders or captains and they draft their own squad. And once that's complete, you just assign a coach and say, Hey, you take Johnny's group. I'll take Bobby's group, whatever. And you break your team down into like platoons or squads based on how many assistants you have. And then, you know, however you want, we've always done uh, colors or nicknames and then you have your own little squad. And part of that is, I was struggling years ago with how do I get my assistant coaches to have some ownership in the culture and, and the rules of the team. So I thought, why don't I give them each, you know, a quarter of the kids and say, if you have a kid late to practice in your squad, you handle that. And unless a parent gets involved or it goes nuclear, I don't even need to know, like you, you handle that in your own squad. And then you can have your kids that are leaders handle the little stuff. And so the kids and assistants have more ownership. Um, and then the other thing, we just wanted to integrate our locker room and the classic football locker room, you know, back when I played was here's the freshman side and then you had the sophomore bank lockers and then the juniors and the seniors had the cool spot that everybody wanted to move up to. But if you think about it, all those freshmen are down on the end. They're new. They don't know how to put knee pads in their pants. They don't know how you do things. And they're surrounded by other knucklehead freshmen. And so seniors hate this at first and everywhere I've gone, the first year is a battle, the second year is a few skirmishes. And then by the third year, it's just, Hey, that's how we do things. But 
if you could plug in a couple seniors and a couple juniors and a couple sophomores and a couple freshmen in one bank and just mix them up and that freshman has a question about equipment or what we wear or how we do things then there's a senior within arms to reach that can say hey little freshman here's how we do stuff and if they're having problems you know hazing is a, a huge deal and probably one of the main reasons why coaches lose jobs is the, the freshman waterboarding or stupid jockstrap rituals that always happen back when we played and so we've tried to say like hey freshman you have that big bad senior that you get dressed by and you talk to and you stretch with every day and if you have problems or somebody's picking on you or even school issues you can go to that big bad senior and he can have your back or help you out and then if it's a big deal he can go to his coach and i think a lot of us do this but whatever you do at the start of practice for attendance like stretching lines or your warm up, we've just always done it by squad. And then instead of having one coach or manager take attendance for the whole thing, you just take, let's say you're 10 kids and you know them by name and you only have to mark kids that are gone. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. So here, here's an attendance sheet and I tried to make it small on purpose and I'll explain this, um, but here's the list of kids and then every green bar was a new team. And so what we did is we just said, if a kid was at practice, let's say you're in charge of black team as a coach, we had a Google sheet each day, like AM, PM practice, two it is. You go in, if you put a one, that meant they were there on time and it turns it green with conditional formatting. If you put an E that turned it gray, that meant they were excused. So our rule is as long as you let us know ahead of time before practice, it's excused. Um, that, that's sort of a neutral thing. It's not a huge deal. Some kids showed up late or joined the team or had a doctor appointment, whatever. If the kid was late to practice, you had to put an L and that would turn it orange like this box. And then of course the big no-no is red. If you put in a zero, that meant the kid was a no call or a no show. And our expectation is after three of those, you're off the team. And so uh, an example is if you took these teams and said like every green line, here's a new squad, here's a squad, here's a squad. You don't even have to come to my practices or know any of my coaches. You could look at this and say, okay, number one, whatever coach was in charge of this squad, I mean, this is clean. They did not have attendance problems. They had a few excuse kids at the end, no big deal. Uh, whoever's in charge of this mess right here, uh, Red's kids who ended up quitting or getting kicked off look at all this orange and red like that guy is not being an enforcer with his team and even though he has that little group of like eight guys to take attendance there's some underlying problems there and the point is not who the kids are in the team it's how they're led so like who's the captain that's in charge of that squad or who's the assistant coach or if you're the head coach and you see you know right about here maybe the second week of practice We've had unexcused late, unexcused late. Okay, multiple kids. There's an issue. I got to go talk to this guy and make sure that this squad is getting handled. And the point is, if you just took attendance as a whole team and maybe one coach did that, how do you focus in and, and try to fix that or have a talk with those kids? Um, it's hard to do. So the more you can break it down into small groups or one-on-one -on -one activities, the better. And well, the other thing we do with those squads is we do something called BST, which stands for Brotherhood and Stretch Time. And at my current school, there hasn't been a lot of stretching, but we're not big on static stretching. And so it's sort of what we do at the end of every practice is you break up and go take a knee with your coach. So the same guy that checked you in at practice at, at warm-ups or stretch line, you're going to circle up. And there's going to be a conversation about culture or leadership or being a man, something that doesn't have to do with football. And I had a coach who was in charge of that and did a great job who put all those in a Google Doc, which you can find in the link at the beginning and the end of the presentation if you just want some questions to go with. But we would just take a question and say, all right, each coach, go have your little circle of guys and let them go around and talk about it. And the more you can get kids to talk, the better. And so the idea is even on a big team, we had 130 plus kids in our program this year that kid shows up to practice and has FaceTime with one assistant who says, you know, hey, let's go, glad you're here on time, whatever, high five Johnny. And no matter what position you play or grade you're in, you're also gonna end practice for about 10 minutes with the same coach and have a discussion about something other than football 
so you can get to know them and use that time as a tool to cultivate your culture. So that's been really big for us. Um, and then the last thing is having one-on-one -on -one meetings. And I think an aspect of how your organization handles one-on-one -on -one meetings tells a lot about your success. So for example, if you've ever worked for a principal that the one-on-one -on -one eval meetings you had were just a, a trivial thing and like a joke and, oh, I just have to do this. They probably don't have a real high standard for teachers. Um, and the, the same is true in football programs. I know football programs that the head coach doesn't have one-on-ones with their assistants. I've always done it at least at the end of the season. And one of the things, if you do those at the end of the season, we've all experienced is you sit down, you have a one-on-one -on -one in November, December, and this assistant has some issue or question. And I've always walked away and thought, man, if we would have done this meeting in September or October, that would have been a little thing. We could have handled it and moved on, but here we are at the end of the season and it's a big deal or even a blow up over that. And so after talking to some guys and, and reading some books, we are going to use a one-on-one -on -one meeting template. And I've done this with kids in my position area. So for example, I coach quarterbacks. I've always had one-on-one -on -one meetings with quarterbacks uh, in the coach's office or whatever. But throughout the season and having your coaching staff aligned or your position areas aligned. So a, a great question and a test of this comes from Brian Kite at Focus 3. I think in one of his podcasts, he said, when's the last time your direct supervisor had that one-on-one -on -one talk with you about culture? Not about your eval or the rubric you're evaluated on or the assessment tool. Um, I can honestly say I've taught for 10 or 11 years. I've never had a principal grab me and talk about the culture of my school. The only time I've heard about that is the first year you get hired in those meetings with all the other new people and they tell you what the culture is. And then you go back to your building and everybody asks how the first day indoctrination was and you tell them and then they go, well, let me tell you what the culture really is in the school. Cause it's not what the, the superintendent said or the, the guys in that all district meeting. And so I'd ask the same thing in your football program. If you're an assistant coach, when's the last time your head coach had a one-on-one -on -one talk with you about culture? Most, probably never. They do talk about it maybe the first day in your staff meeting, but I doubt they do that consistently throughout the year in a one-on-one -on -one setting. And so do you use them with players? Um, do you use them with, with playing time? And we all know the number one cause of playing time drama is Johnny thinks he's an all-star. He thinks he's a five-star recruit, and we know he can't chew bubble gum and walk at the same time without tripping. But have you sat him down and told him that and said, here's some stuff you can do to get better. And then do you do that with your coaches? So I have a sample template again, that's in the Google drive folder, what that looks like. And we're going to do this for next year on the left side of your screen, just set up. Okay. Each coach is going to have a one-on-one -on -one huddle three times throughout the season. And I've tried to make this generic. This would be for a program that your freshman are kind of a separate entity like us but i'd say okay it's the head coach here i'm the leader of these guys directly so if it was an org chart in a corporation be like your direct reports now i'm going to have three one-on-ones with my offensive coordinator throughout the season the first one we're going to do anytime from the end of school in june to the week of the first game so you basically have three months to do that and we'll talk about what that looks like i'm going to do that um, again, in the middle of the season, sometimes between week two and five, it really doesn't matter. But once you've already had a couple of games, but before the playoffs, I'm going to go back with the OC and have a one-on-one -on -one with him. And then sometime late in the season, like the last two or three weeks before the playoffs, revisit that. And then I tried to not give anybody more than four that they had to have. And so if you break this down and say, okay, let's say I'm the D coordinator. He only has to come have sort of the sit down end of things with me, but then he's going to have one with each one of his three position coaches, his linebacker DB and um, D line coach. I labeled that wrong. And then also the freshman D coordinator, because that's a different guy in our program. If you don't have the freshman D coordinator, then maybe he only has three, but you got to sit him down and say, okay, here's what we're doing. And this is from coach Rod Olson. He's written a bunch of books. Um, they're like the little short leadership Fables. I've also gotten to hear him speak at a Denver Glazier clinic, which was really good. Um, but you basically say, here's what's going to go on in this meeting, the purpose, the process, and the payoff, kind of like setting the agenda. You remind them 
if it's an assistant coach, here's why I hired you, man. And I try to tell my guys that all the time. This is why we hired you. We could have hired a bunch of other guys, but we picked you because if it's for kids, it's this is why we want you on our team. And then just ask them, how true is your own behavior on a scale from one to 10 to what we say our culture is? And no kid will ever say 10. I've never had a kid say 10. Your best kids will say like seven. Your worst kids will say like seven, <laughs> but they're lying. And then you say, all right, man, what's a way you could make that an eight? What's the thing in our culture that you're not the most true or disciplined on? How can we change that? And then you ask them of everybody else on the team. So maybe the other coaches or the other players, how aligned do you really think our team is to the culture? Again, you're never going to hear anybody say a 10. And you go, all right, what's, thing, what's something that you can do to help the whole team be more aligned to our culture? And then you just pick one thing and say, hey, I really want you to focus on this, make this a goal, do this every day, chart this, whatever. And then just say, hey, man, I love you and I'm glad you're on my team. And so I just made a Google Doc that has this little chart and then templates of these. So you can just print off little slips of paper, almost like an index card and have those talks and put them in a drawer, or do them digitally, whatever you want to do. But the reason we do that, if you think about your biggest pain in the butt, the most toxic person in your locker room, whether that's an assistant coach or a player, I hope it's a player. If it's a coach. You should fire him. Um, but you know, that one player that pushes back on everything, if you had a team meeting with everybody about culture and he's sitting in the back of the meeting room, how effective is that going to be at changing his heart and his mind? And then if you grab that kid one-on-one -on -one after practice for 10 minutes and had a talk like this, just with that one kid and you in the room, how effective would that be at changing his heart and his mind? In my experience, the, the smaller you can make that meeting and that setting, the more effective it is at cultivating culture. So, you know, those five things again um, are huge. And if you can look at your culture, like number one, it's got to be codified and designed because whether we design it or not, we're going to get one. Detach and think about, all right, what would that coach uh, in my league say about my team? Uh, when I got this job, I was actually at a coach's clinic when my current AD called me and offered me the job and not a lot of people knew. And I went up to a coach at that clinic who was going to coach against me in this league. And I said, Hey, what's Kelly Walsh all about? What are those guys like? And man, he ranted and raved and said all this negative stuff about how bad and how they underperform and they should be better. And I even hate the color green. Um, the, the perspective I got there, was very different than if you asked my AD or my principal who hired me, Hey, what's your, what's your assessment of our program? You know, it wasn't rosy. They didn't lie to me, but it definitely wasn't as brutally honest as you'd get from somebody in your league. So you can think about your own program in that way. You're going to get a way truer picture to assess. Um, culture is just how you do things. It's the standard. It's not abstract. It's not warm and fuzzy. It's just the how it's shaped by what you proclaim, promote and permit in that order. And then the more you can break down teams and groups into to small settings or even one-on-one, -on -one, the better you're going to be able to cultivate the culture of your program. So if you've read any of these books or listened to these podcasts, these are big influences on me when it comes to culture. Some of the stuff is, is straight word for word from them. Um, so these are all great resources to check out. I by no means come up with any of this stuff on my own. Uh, or been perfect at it. I'm just trying to get better and, and build a program here at Kelly Walsh. So I appreciate um, everybody who I've stolen stuff from. And then here's my name and contact info again, email, Twitter. And if you go to that link there, you can find the stuff in the Google Drive folder. So I appreciate your time and the opportunity to, to share. And thank you again, Coach Panstra, for having me on.